Many people understandably associate firearms with violence and bloodshed. And because decent people don't want violence and bloodshed, many instinctively dislike or fear firearms and support so-called gun control, based on the assumption that outlawing firearms would mean reducing violence and bloodshed. In reality, this is not at all the case. Saying, I don't want a firearm because I don't want violence and bloodshed is no more rational than saying, I don't want an airbag because I don't want to crash. Of course, the reason people want airbags is not because they're eager to crash, but because they understand that in the unfortunate event that they do get into a serious accident, having an airbag is very likely to reduce human pain and suffering. And so it is with firearms. In the unfortunate event that violence does occur, Good people being armed can dramatically reduce or eliminate human pain and suffering, especially the pain and suffering of innocent people. Everyone knows you shouldn't use something like a chainsaw if you don't know how to use it properly, or if you think you might hurt yourself or someone else. It's the same with firearms. If you don't feel comfortable with them, or you think you may hurt yourself or someone else, either don't have one or learn to use one properly. But make no mistake. If you do not possess the means and the willingness to forcibly defend yourself and your family, that won't magically stop the nasty people out there from having the means and the willingness to victimize you. Ask yourself this simple question. If someday you happen to be where an armed thug or deranged killer strikes, would the people there be better off with you armed or with you unarmed? Unfortunately, the bad guys of the world aren't nice enough to give advanced warning of where or when they intend to attack. If such an event does occur, they aren't going to wait around for you to go and buy a gun so you can come back and stop them. You will either prepare ahead of time or you won't be prepared. Do you put your seatbelt on only when you're about to have an accident? Or is it better to wear it all the time, even if you won't actually need it the vast majority of the time? Now, some politicians and pundits accuse those who support an individual's right to keep and bear arms of wanting violence to occur. You have to wonder, would the same politicians and pundits also accuse people who wear seatbelts of wanting to crash? If there was some way to wave a magic wand and disarm all the bad guys in the world, that would be nice. But in the real world, the best chance the innocent have for staying safe and alive is for good people to possess the means to resist violent attackers with defensive force of their own. The evidence shows that responsible people being armed reduces crime, and the government's own crime statistics show that privately owned firearms prevent between one and two million crimes every year, usually without a shot even being fired. Now think about this. We've all seen thousands of examples of bad guys in movies using guns to do bad things. But have you ever seen a Hollywood movie or a TV show that depicted an average armed citizen preventing a crime? In real life, it happens all the time. So why does Hollywood almost never show it happening? Whether it's the result of ignorance or some political agenda, movie makers constantly misrepresent gun owners and not only seem clueless about firearms and how they work, but seem completely ignorant of even the most basic rules of firearm ownership, rules which millions of Americans know by heart. Treat every gun as if it is loaded. Always be aware of where the barrel is pointed and never aim any gun, loaded or not, whether your finger is on the trigger or not, at anything you don't intend to destroy. Keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire. Always be aware of what is around and especially behind your target. And don't fire if you're not sure where the bullet might go or who or what it might hit. Even the supposed good guys in movies violate these rules constantly. So is it any wonder that so many Americans are scared of firearms? It makes sense when the mainstream culture is always bombarding them with examples of guns being used irresponsibly or maliciously, while almost never showing normal, decent people using firearms responsibly and defensively. And unlike movie makers, politicians obviously cannot plead ignorance to the crime statistics of their own agencies. So why are they always pushing to disarm the public? Why all the emotionalism and cries about saving the children from people who know full well that the danger to innocent people increases when the good people are disarmed? Obviously, some sociopath who doesn't mind violating laws against assault and murder won't mind violating gun laws either. By definition, gun control only disarms the law-abiding, and politicians know this. So why do they keep pushing for what they know will increase violent crime? First, let's be clear about what gun control really is. Gun control is not about doing away with guns. It's about making it so that only cops and soldiers have guns. Have you ever heard any politician suggesting that his enforcers and protectors be disarmed? 
Their goal is not to make guns disappear, but to create a huge imbalance of power with government agents remaining heavily armed and everyone else left helpless. The politicians know that wouldn't make you and me any safer. Far from it. So what is their agenda? Government is about control. By way of taxation, you are forced to fund the politicians' schemes. Whenever they enact a law, they aren't asking you nicely to behave a certain way. They are ordering you to do or not do certain things with the threat that their hired enforcers will punish you if you disobey. You know this, even though you'll rarely hear it described this bluntly and honestly. The so-called lawmakers think they have the right to forcibly dominate and extort you. If you don't like funding warmongering, bailouts, a giant welfare state, or a giant police state, they don't care. You will pay up, or eventually they will send their men with guns to take your property or put you in prison. This is true of so-called gun control laws as well. If some peaceful, moral person owns a gun for self-defense, after the politicians declared that to be illegal, what happens to them? Other men with guns show up and using violence or the threat of violence forcibly take that person hostage. In reality, so-called gun control is gun violence. It's obvious why those in power want their own enforcers to be armed, so they can force you to obey them. And it should be just as obvious why the last thing the controllers would want is for you to possess the means to resist their enforcers. As people get more and more upset about what those in Washington are doing, and more inclined to resist, it should come as no surprise that those in government are becoming more desperate to disarm the people. They don't care if you whine in protest, but they do care if you disobey. And they know that if they had all the guns, it would be a lot easier to keep you subservient and obedient. You may not like hearing this. You may want to believe the rhetoric we're taught about the politicians representing and serving us, as if we're in charge, as if they care about what we think. But deep down, you know that's a lie. You know that if you don't do as you're told, their prisons and their armed enforcers will be waiting for you. So do you still want to pretend that they work for you? In recent years, those in power have engaged in more and more fear-mongering regarding so-called assault weapons, military-style rifles. What you won't hear from the politicians, but what the government's own crime statistics show, is that such weapons are used in only a tiny percentage of crimes. So why do the politicians focus on them so much? Such firearms are not at all ideal for the common criminal, since they are expensive, unwieldy, and difficult to conceal, which is why the common criminals hardly ever use them. However, such weapons are ideal for a very different purpose, resisting government. And that is why politicians despise and fear them. They aren't worried about the common criminal who might victimize you. They are worried about you having the means to resist their attempts to control you. If you doubt this, Take a look at how some in government have recently been characterizing people as potential terrorists, merely for objecting to high taxation, or opposing gun control, or protesting other authoritarian power grabs. In short, if you value freedom, then those who think it's their place to dominate and control you view you as the enemy. So doesn't it make perfect sense that they would want you to be unarmed? If this is sounding too radical or scary to you, keep in mind why the Second Amendment was written. Even with the Constitution in place, the Founders still thought it was ultimately the job of the people, not any legislature or court, to decide when the government had gone too far and to forcibly resist if necessary. So is it any wonder that the American ruling class now views anyone who talks too much about the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence as a possible terrorist? If you were a tyrant, how would you view people who were cheering for a document which says that the people have the duty to alter or abolish any government which becomes a violator of individual rights? Some who still celebrate the American Revolution as a noble victory for freedom argue that oppression in the U.S. today is not bad enough to justify forcible resistance again. But by any objective measure, what the United States ruling class is afflicting upon the American people now is far worse than anything King George ever did taxation levels ten times higher and far more intrusive and unavoidable than they were before the revolution. Government bureaucracies, regulators, and enforcers interfering in people's lives in a thousand ways that the British Crown never even dreamed of back then. Yet Americans still celebrate the 4th of July, while making excuses for why today they wouldn't dream of disobeying the ruling class. Many will insist that as long as we have a constitution, and as long as we're allowed to protest, and especially as long as we're allowed to vote, there will never be a need for people to resort to outright resistance. Unfortunately, history shows that such an opinion is completely misguided. 
When Mao Zedong was in power in communist China, heading the most murderous regime in history, the people had a constitution which said they had the right to protest and petition and allowed them to vote. When Joseph Stalin was in power in Soviet Russia, heading the second most murderous regime in history, the people had a constitution which said they had the right to protest and petition and allowed them to vote. When the Nazi party was elected into power in Germany, the people had a constitution which said they had the right to protest and petition and allowed them to vote. Today, in North Korea, one of the most brutal oppressive regimes on the planet, the people still have a constitution which says they have the right to protest and petition and allows them to vote. What all those other constitutions did not include, however, was the right of the people to be armed. The lesson to be learned here is that constitutions and words on paper do not stop tyranny. Being allowed to protest and vote does not stop tyranny. So what does? Patrick Henry, who gave the famous give me liberty or give me death speech, answers that question, saying that when it comes to liberty, nothing will preserve it but downright force. Adding that whenever you give up that force, you are ruined. Interestingly, the three worst mass murderers in history seem to agree. Mao Zedong declared that the Communist Party must command all the guns. That way no guns can ever be used to command the party. Joseph Stalin proclaimed, if the opposition disarms, well and good. If it refuses to disarm, we shall disarm it ourselves. And Adolf Hitler bluntly stated, the most foolish mistake we could possibly make would be to allow the subject races to possess arms. And if you want to know what happens when authoritarian regimes succeed in disarming people, all you need to do is open a history book. This is what the world looks like when the good people are not armed. Tyranny has never been ended and freedom has never been achieved by asking nicely. Frederick Douglass summed up the truth quite well when he said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what the people will submit to and you have found out the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. History has shown us just how true it is that authoritarian power concedes nothing without a demand. And if government enforcers have these and the people don't, only one side will be in any position to demand anything. And that above all else is why good people should be armed. <laughs>